Um, okay, so today I wanted to, um, to discuss Lee Algebroids first, uh, and then in the second talk, um, I'm going to try to give the, the, uh, the main kind of application of these types of groupoids that I introduced in the first two talks. But for, for this talk, it's all going to be about um, Lie algebroids, certain examples of Lie algebroids. So, okay, so uh, remember, remember that a Lie algebroid is a vector bundle Uh, and this um, this vector bundle also comes with a map, a bundle map, which is called the anchor map. Uh, and this map is to the tangent bundle. So there's always a reference. Uh, you can always refer to the tangent vector fields. Any section of the algebraid, there's always a s tangent vector underneath it. So you can always um, do this comparison. And, uh, and there's also a bracket on the sections of A. And, um, and then there was this, uh, this Leibniz rule, which I needed the anchor in order to be able to differentiate this function um, for the Leibniz rule. I needed to have this method of comparison with the tangent bundle. OK, so, so it <clears throat> When you encounter something like this, uh, to first approximation, you should think that this is a uh, replacement for the tangent bundle. It's very similar in all, in all respects. It has a bracket, um, and it has a Leibniz rule, and the, the bracket is a Lie bracket, so it satisfies the Jacobi identity just like the usual. So that means that whatever you are used to doing with the tangent bundle, which is pretty much all of differential geometry, is you use the tangent bundle. You can do it with A as well. So it's like a replacement for the tangent bundle. So just as for TM, we have a Duram complex. And, uh, and this Duram complex, I'll call it like this. I'll say that it's mega K. That's the usual Duram complex. And I'll just put a. Uh, a subscript A. Um, and the differential, instead of just the usual Duram differential, it'll be subscript A. And uh, just as before, um, the K forms, the algebraid K forms on a certain open set uh, are nothing but uh, the sections over the open set of wedge k of the dual bundle of A. And uh, whether you want to work in the smooth category uh, or the holomorphic category, uh, that would determine uh, what type of sections you take, holomorphic sections or smooth sections. And, uh, and then the, um, <clears throat> the differential, as usual, goes from k forms to k plus 1 forms. And uh, it has the usual formula. So that if I'm differentiating an n form, the result will be an n plus 1 form. Well, yeah, let me be consistent. Let's say I'm differentiating a k form, then it'll take k plus 1 arguments. And there's, a, there's two sums. So there's a minus 1 to the i plus uh, a sum over ij of minus 1 to the i plus j. And the first term here is going to be um, the k form evaluated on all of the inputs except for i, which is removed. This thing is a function, which is then differentiated by the remaining ai. But of course, to do that differentiation, I need to use the anchor to do the differentiation. This term is going to be uh, the k form evaluated on k inputs, one of which is going to be the 
Lie bracket or the algebraic bracket of the i and j. So you put it like this, a i, a j. This is the bracket in the Lie algebraic a, so I'll just emphasize it by putting that there. And then you have the rest of the inputs where you remove i and j. Okay, so that's the usual formula for the exterior derivative transported to this more general situation where you have this algebraic a. Now, um, and of course, dA squares to 0 uh, for exactly the same reason as, uh, as for the Duran derivative. Um, and also, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, th something which is obvious is that the same type of calculus that you're used to doing with differential forms is, is present here. So that A acts on its Duran complex by exterior by in interior product, namely, if I have some, some um, section of A, um, this, uh, this gives us an interior product operation um, uh, from k forms to k minus 1 forms, which is called I sub A. Uh, which is uh, exactly as in the usual case. You just hook in A, you, you pu pu put it into the first, uh, first position. And, and then the usual calculus of these, uh, of the differential forms holds. Um, you, have a, you have a Lie derivative operator, which is D I A, D A I A plus I A D A. And you have um, the Cartan formula, which is that the algebraic bracket of A and B by interior product acts as the uh, commutator between um, the Lie derivative by A and the interior product by B. So Cartan's, this is a commutator here. So the Cartan formula, as usual, holds. So it's the, the same story. I just wanted to really emphasize. So um, actually, th this, formula, this formula is a, is a good one to remember, always, I'll just rewrite it here. So it, it says that the algebraic bracket by interior product is the same operator as, let me just re write this out. So sometimes you'll see it written like this. Where these are commutators. And there's a notion of degree. So so that uh, you'll notice that these are both degree one operators. And so this is this actually, it's di plus id. Uh, this is a degree zero uh, operator. And this is, so that means this is an actual commutator. So that's why there's a difference in sign between the two types of commutators. Um, but this shows the relationship between the algebraic bracket and the algebraic differential. Okay, they, so a lot of people are, I mean, the traditional thing to say is that, is that this, this algebraic bracket is dual in some sense to the um, algebraic differential. Uh, the correct uh, terminology is that this is a derived bracket, so that you could think of this bracket, this algebraic bracket, as being a derived bracket in the sense that it's derived from this operator, dA, by using commutators. So this leads right away to algebraid uh, Duram, Duram cohomology. And that's uh, what I want to focus on today. So there's a difference here between how you think about Duram cohomology, uh, whether you're in the smooth or the holomorphic context. And I want to make that precise. So in the smooth, in the smooth category, okay, it's quite easy. Because what you do is um, the, the way that you, um, the way that you, uh, <clears throat> you compute Duram cohomology is that you take k forms on the entire manifold, you apply the operator, and you look at its kernel. And then you, you, you mod out by, by the image. So, so the kth Duram cohomology. 
the algebraic Duram cohomology, is just defined to be the kernel of dA acting on k forms on the whole manifold, like this. Let me just say that it's acting on here, divided by the image of dA. Um, uh, or let me just write it more precisely, dA of omega k minus 1 a of x. OK. So uh, there's no um, issues here. Um, uh, this is exactly as in the Duram complex. Um, this could be, however, an infinite dimensional space, right? Just like the, the vector space of all smooth differential forms is an infinite dimensional space. But we're used to this idea of, of taking kernel mod image of this complex. Just um, <clears throat> a note that if, if, uh, if the anchor map of the algebraid is not, um, is not um, you know, an isomorphism, uh, this is not elliptic. Well, this is not necessarily elliptic. It's not even, it doesn't even have to be subjective, really. So it's, the point is that ellipticity here is not guaranteed. Uh, so, um, okay. Nevertheless, we're going to see an example where this uh, quotient uh, is finite dimensional, even though it isn't elliptic, even though the, the Duram complex is not elliptic. Um, OK, so there's no issue here. But in the holomorphic context, this would be a horrible definition. In the holomorphic category, this will never work. It's awful. And the reason is because you're taking global holomorphic sections of this bundle, the bundle of wedge k a star. And there may be no global holomorphic sections at all. There are only local holomorphic sections. So this is going to be empty. And so the, um, the problem is that it will look like, it, it, I mean, this will have no um, good properties uh, like we have in the smooth category. So in the holomorphic category, and this is something that has been known since you know, the 50s or the 60s, in the holomorphic category, you need to be a little bit, um, you need to resolve um, the Duram complex uh, before um, you know, computing <coughs> cohomology. Okay? So how, how do you do that? Um, there's many ways of doing the resolution. There's no unique way. Uh, a good way is, let's say, using check cover, an open cover. Right? So if we have. As an example, if, if we express x as an open cover, um, then uh, what you can do is you can, um, you can create, uh, you can create a bicomplex a, a complex that looks like this, where you look at the k minus 1 forms on one open set. So we're, we're really, you have to imagine that we're covering, we're covering the complex manifold by these open sets, analytic open sets, suppose. OK, and so if I look on the open set UI, there's plenty of sections now. There's plenty of sections. And so we can apply the operator dA, and that will give us, bring us to omega k a u i, and so on, omega k plus 1 a of u i. OK, and then what we have is, um, so what I want to do is to consider, is in, the, in the check formalism, you just take a sum over all i of this. OK. So this is a perfectly good um, complex. Um, but now what I want to do is to measure um, you know, whether or not two of these k forms, a k form on ui and a k form on uj, you want to measure whether they agree on the overlap. Okay? And the operator that checks the difference between them on the overlap is called the check differential. And it's called delta. 
And where does delta go? Well, delta goes to the sum over all ij of omega k minus 1. I'm not changing the degree of the form. I'm just taking differences of forms of ui intersect uj. You can apply a differential to this, and you can apply check differential to this, and you'll get a sum over ij of omega k a ui intersect uj. Okay, and we can continue and go to triple intersections, i, j, and k, omega k minus 1 a of u, i intersect u, j intersect u, k. Okay. And in this way, we get a double complex. Okay, so it's, so it's a double complex like this, right? probably seen these things before. So when you have a double complex, <coughs> this means that all these squares commute. And whenever you have a double complex, there's a way of collapsing it to get a single complex, which is called the total complex. The total complex. Um, so we can collapse to a single complex. Um, <clears throat> which is called the, the total complex. Um, and, <clears throat> and this will have a differential d. So how is this defined? The total in degree k is simply um, the sum <clears throat> over p plus q equals k of um, omega P A uh, uh, yeah, so let me put it this way. So this this is a bicomplex C with two two indices, okay? And the, the total complex of this thing is obtained by taking the sum along the diagonals. So this is tot, uh, well, OK, this is tot uh, k minus 1, I, I guess. There would be other things. I, I, I'm s then this one here would be uh, tot uh, k and et cetera. There's other things that I haven't drawn which come from the previous degrees. Um, and then the derivative is just um, uh, d. Uh, it's just a delta plus a certain <coughs> sign, which depends on the degree, um, the check degree. So let me just put c check for the check degree uh, times dA. So it's, you just need to. It's because these commute, so what you want to do is um, take the sum of this operator and this operator to define the total differential. But there has to be a sign in between them in order so that it squares to 0. So that's the sign. It's the check degree, depending on how high you are up vertically. OK. And then, and then the cohomology of this. is called the algebraic cohomology of x. This is defined to be um, the, um, the kth cohomology of the complex uh, tot with respect to d. Okay, so that's the extra um, headache that you have to do when you're working in the holomorphic category. And this is also true when you have to do the actual Duram complex. So, so if you take you know, if, if this is the holomorphic, holomorphic um, Duram complex, um, this is how you obtain the, uh, the actual complex Duram cohomology of a complex manifold. You have to do this procedure. Um, and uh, s sometimes this is given the name bold H, bold H K of the complex um, of the original uh, of the original holomorphic complex. So 
So the point is that uh, this result is independent of the choice of this resolution. So we could have changed the cover, or at least if the cover is fine enough, if it's fine enough, then it doesn't depend on the cover. And it also doesn't depend on the choice that we made of doing a check resolution. We could have done a dull bow resolution or some other type of resolution. And um, so this, the, the term for this is called hypercohomology. Um, it's called hypercohomology because you're, you're extracting a cohomology group not from a single vector bundle, but from a complex of vector bundles. So you apply this functor to a complex of sheaves or a complex of vector bundles. Um, that's why it's called hypercohomology. Normally, cohomology is just with coefficients in a single, in a single sheaf. OK, so um, uh, yeah, so that's how you define the Duram complex of an algebroid. And in, in fact, you could always define it this way. You could always define it this way. But the fact that this complex, that the individual terms in this complex in the smooth category, the fact that those are fine sheaves, means that the whole thing collapses. And you can take global sections and use the old definition. But this definition is the, is the more uh, general one that works in, in both cases. OK, so um, now I'm going to run through uh, a bunch of examples of algebraids. OK, so the first example is the tangent bundle itself, where we take the, um, the anchor map to be the identity, the identity map. And then um, the Duram cohomology is equal to um, the usual cohomology with coefficients in R or C, depending on, on whether you're, you take this to be a complex bundle or a real bundle. So we have um, that. The second example is if we take um, a subbundle, which is involutive. So involutive just means that the bracket of vector fields restricts to F. So that means that F has, has a bracket. And then the inclusion map gives us the anchor map. And in this case, um, the algebraid Duram cohomology is called the, the foliated Duram complex. And the important thing to remember always about this is that we have an inclusion of f into t, which means that the dual is a map from t star to f star, okay? which means that if I have a, um, so this means that we have wedge k of i star maps from wedge k t star x to wedge k f star. So, so here we have the usual Duram complex, and here we have the algebraid Duram complex, and the map goes from here to here. We can take a form on the total space on x, and we can restrict it along the leaves of the foliation f. So this means that it's going this way, not this way. So the, you should think of the forms, the algebraid forms in this case, are not usual forms. Um, they are, they are uh, s sections of the dual of f. Of f. So this, this kind of measures, in some sense, this measures the Duram cohomology of the leaves, but it somehow puts them all together into one cohomology theory. So that can be very tricky, what the result is.
Okay. Um, okay. And also, I also want to note about this example that any algebroid defines a uh, distribution which is obtained by just applying the anchor to A and looking at what the result is inside Tx. Okay. But this, this, this rank, the rank can jump. Of this in general. In this case, we were assuming that this is a sub-bundle, so it has constant rank. But in general, the algebroid, if you map it into the tangent, that can, that can jump. Uh, nevertheless, you have, um, uh, but still, have smooth, uh, immersed leaves. So you have what they call a singular foliation in the Stefan and Sussman uh, sense. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now we'll see uh, a different type of example. Suppose that now we have um, what's sometimes called a divisor in the manifold X, which means that it's, at least for now, let's assume that it's um, just a, uh, <clears throat> a hypersurface. So it's a smooth hypersurface. So. Another picture, uh, a useful picture is this, D and X. So co-dimension one. Hypersurface means co-dimension one, submanifold. Okay. Then we can do the following thing. We can uh, define TX, well, let me write it this way, TX minus log D. So this is, um, vector fields on X with a certain constraint. These are vector fields on X which are constrained to be tangent to D. Okay. So um, at, at the moment, I've only defined it as a sheaf in the sense that I'm telling you what its local sections are. So the local sections are um, defined by vector fields with a certain constraint. Um, but uh, but this this sheaf is locally free. Okay, which what does that mean? Locally free as a module over the functions of X. So that means that I should be able to find a basis in you know near every point. I should be able to find a basis of generators for this, which is uh, finite. So let's say if we have coordinates, so to show this, um, uh, we can choose coordinates um, such that D is cut out by um, the first coordinate. So we'll say that we have a coordinate system where x1 is pointing normal to d, and the other uh, x2 up to xn are along d. So in such a coordinate system, um, d is just given by x1 equals to 0. Um, and uh, then um, v, a vector field, is tangent to D. When is it tangent to D? Well, the components which are pointing uh, along the x2, x3, up to xn directions, those are all tangent to D. The constraint is really on the first term of this sum, the first term being alpha 1 d by dx1. d by dx1 is pointing normal to D. And so the constraint is that that, uh, that function alpha 1 um, 
So if and only if alpha 1 is x1 times some smooth function f for some f. So this means that we have, so locally, tx minus log d is generated over, I'll just use this notation for the functions on x, even though they could be smooth or, or smooth or holomorphic, it doesn't matter. So it's generated by um, certainly the vector fields d by dx2, d by dx3, these are all generators which are tangent to d, up to d by dxn. But then we also have the key one in the first component here, it would be f times x1 d by dx1. Okay. So there are, there's a basis of n sections locally. And so this defines, this means that tx minus log d is a rank n vector bundle just like the tangent bundle, same rank. The inclusion of sections, the inclusion of sections, which goes like, if you want it to be really precise, you would say, you know, all the vector fields on the open set U, which are tangent to D, they include into all the vector fields on U. Or maybe, maybe more, more comfortably would be like this. This inclusion here. This inclusion um, is, li is linear over the functions, is OX linear. So it gives a bundle map from Tx minus log d to T. And this is, this, is the, this is the anchor map. And of course, uh, it inherits uh, a Lie bracket. Because if two vector fields are tangent to D, then their Lie brackets will also be tangent to D. Okay. So in, in coordinates, if you chose coordinates, then this map rho, this is a map from a rank n bundle to a rank n bundle. So it's given by an n by n matrix if you choose bases everywhere. So if we choose the standard basis here, of d by dx1 up to d by dxn, and you choose the basis here, which is the sections that I gave, then this matrix would be given by x1, and then an identity matrix here, and zeros. That would, that would be what the anchor map looks like. So the anchor map is something which is an isomorphism everywhere except along x1 equals to zero, where it drops rank and becomes rank n minus one. It's, it, this notation has been around in algebraic geometry for ages. Um, that's the reason I use it. Uh, the reason that they use it is because, um, uh, well, okay, there's two things in the notation. There's a minus and then there's a log D. Okay, so the reason that there's a log D is because if I, so if I take the dual of this bundle, I think that's probably literally what I have next. That's literally what I have next. So the dual bundle, so if, if A is Tx minus log D, then the notation for the dual bundle is that this is T star X log D. So I'll explain to you why this one is called T star log D. <laughs> the reason for the minus sign is to indicate the duality the duality. So here, this is T star log D. This has dual basis. Okay, so what would the dual basis look like? Dx2, Dx3, those are the one forms, Dxn, but then there, you have to have some notation for the dual 
one form to this. And so the notation is dx1 over x1. And this is sometimes written as d log of x1. And that's the reason for the notation. So normally, so it's very important. So this point is a very important point. The following point is a very important point, which is that normally we would look at this expression and we would think of it as a, as a section of the, dual, of the dual of the tangent bundle. And in so doing, we would be looking, staring at a singular one form. This is not a smooth one form. Okay, but this is a basis section for this new bundle that we've created. So it's a basis section for this different vector bundle, which is related to the cotangent. So you can, you know, there's a map from this to the tangent, and so from the cotangent, there is a dual map to this. So there is a comparison with the cotangent. If you compare, if you take this nice smooth section of A star, and if you compare it to a section of T star, you'll get something singular, okay? Because it's, this, this is a section of A star which does not come from a section, so let me write that, dx over x is a smooth section of A star which is not in the image of the map rho star from T star x to T star x log d. That's the point, is that there's a different point of view that we're viewing this not as a singular form, but rather as a, as a um, section of a different bundle. Okay. That's a really important Lie algebroid to uh, understand, and I learned about it for the first time in Alan Weinstein's um, introduction to Lie algebroids and Lie groupoids on the very last page. He describes this Lie algebroid, and uh, I put the link to that on the exercise sheet. Yeah. So everything so far is just that d is a codimension one submanifold of x, whether it's holomorphic or smooth. Nothing I've said so far depends on, on which category you're in. So, so for example, x is R1 and d is one Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's okay. That's, so you're, saying, you're imagining something that vanishes to infinite order like that. No. It is, it is. It, it's, always, it, it's always a multiple of x. You can always write this function as x times something. Yeah, these are called, these are exactly, these are called flat functions. And there, you can always take out a power of x and write them as power of x times some smooth function, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so now let's look at the Duram cohomology of this algebroid T minus log D. Okay, and there are, um, so j just to, uh, to make sure that we know what we're talking about, um, so a form, a logarithmic uh, form, uh, let's say if I have one of them, omega, which is a k-form logarithmic, all of what I said before means that in the local coordinate system where that's a basis for the T star, it has to look like this. It has to be dx1 over x1 wedge some alpha plus some beta where, um, where this this is a smooth k minus one form, and this is a smooth k form. Okay. The, the logarithmic part has to be concentrated in just this dx1 over x1. You can't take wedge products of this with itself because it's, uh, anything wedge itself is zero. So th this is what any logarithmic form looks like. It has two components, alpha and beta, which are smooth forms of differing degrees, and these are not well defined. They're not well defined um, because if I change the coordinates, 
I'm going to get, you know, this term will always be there. There's always going to be a singular term, but then the exact nature of alpha and beta is going to be changed. Okay. Okay, but nevertheless, there are two very important uh, uh, facts. The first fact is that um, <clears throat> there's a short exact sequence. If I have a, a logarithmic form, there's a residue map which extracts the residue, which is a k minus 1 form along d. And this takes uh, omega and maps it to alpha. Okay. Alpha is a k minus 1 form on x, which I told you is not well defined. But if I take that form and I restrict it, or if I pull it back to d, then that is well defined. So alpha restricted to d. Um, that's called the residue of omega along d. And if I should have, if it happens that I have a logarithmic form, and if I test it, if I ask what is your residue, and it says zero, that means that alpha vanishes on D, which means that alpha is x1 times something smooth, which means that the x1 and the x1 cancels out, and there is no logarithmic term, which means that if its residue is zero, this thing has to be smooth. So this is an exact sequence of sheaves, again, in, in, any, in either one of the categories. Okay, the second important fact um, is that um, x, if I take x, I can always remove d. This is an open set inside x. Well, let's just, if, if d is closed, say. This includes into, into x. And so this means that I have a pullback map from the logarithmic cohomology, uh, from the logarithmic Duram complex to the usual smooth Duram complex of x minus d. Okay. So this means that I can, you know, if I take something which has any kind of singularity on d I want, I can always pull it back to the complement of d and get a smooth form. And so that means that I can always compare. So, okay, so these two facts are. Um, are very so this is a morphism of this is a morphism of complexes okay and it induces you know a, a morphism of cohomology so uh, what i want to say is that this means that the logarithmic cohomology is related to the following things it's related to the cohomology of d it's related to the cohomology of x and it's related to the cohomology of x minus d and those are three completely different cohomology theories. And all of them are, are playing together when you're dealing with this, this one. OK. So now what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you the theorems. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the, the theorems which uh, compute these cohomology, this cohomology groups. Do I have until 1230? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So 1240. Okay. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to do the computation of this logarithmic cohomology. And I'm going to do it in the smooth category first and then in the holomorphic category. The funny thing is that in the smooth category, I'm going to use this fact. And in the holomorphic category, I'm going to use this fact. And the answers are completely different. So computation, well, it's not really a computation. It's really just a theorem about what it is. Rela I mean, I'm re just relating, relating it to usual cohomology. So uh, number one, in the smooth, smooth category, okay. So in the, in the smooth category, we can split. sequence 1. We can split sequence 1 not just as, a, as an exact sequence of, um, I don't know, sheaves, but we can split as differential complexes. Okay. 
Okay, so let me explain to you. So what I mean here is that, is that uh, this complex, well, let me put the, the differential operators underneath. So this is a complex, right? It has a differential. This has a complex dA, and this has a complex d. So this is a sequence of complexes. And the claim is that in the smooth category, we can split this thing as a sequence of complexes. So how do we see this? So um, we're going to need, so we need the following tools. So number one, uh, or let's say I, I'm going to need, uh, so I'm going to give a somewhat simplified proof. I'm going to assume that I have a function, a smooth function that cuts out D transversally. So a function cut it, cuts out D transversally. So D is F inverse of 0. In fact, I, I don't really need this. I, I just need a, an easy way to do this proof in general would be to choose a smooth function that cuts it out to order 2, which even non-orientable normal bundle submanifolds have. And you can proceed with the proof in the same way. But anyway, just assume that we have a function that cuts out D. Okay. Um, the second thing I'm going to need is a bump function, a bump function h near d. Okay. And, uh, and the third thing I'm going to need is um, a smoothing L of the log of um, f at d. So let me draw pictures of these three things. So if this is x and this is d, the first thing I need is f, which cuts out d. That's number one. Number two is that I need a bump function near d. Okay. The third thing that I need is a smoothing of the log of the defining function. So the log looks like, like this, and it's singular at, at d. So what, you, what I want is to agree with the log and then just smooth it out. I don't really care how. So for, that's the tools that I need. And when you have these tools, then you can, you can define a splitting, which will go this way. Oh, um, da -da -da. Um, OK, there's actually something else that I need. I just need a, a, a tubular neighborhood of, let me call it, uh, yeah, a tubular neighborhood of, uh, of D. I need a tubular neighborhood of D. Um, so let me call it u, and then there's a projection to d. So I just need a, if this is d, I need a little tubular neighborhood of d, which projects to d, just to make my life easier. OK? And what I'm going to give now is the splitting which goes like this. So if I have a k minus 1 form only on d, I need to produce a k form on all of x, which has residue this thing I started with. Okay. So the way that you define it is like this. So if you have a form on d, then what you can do is you can pull it back to the uh, tubular neighborhood. So this thing now is defined in u in the neighborhood of d. Okay? And then I'm going to wedge it with something which uh, vanishes uh, outside u. There's a minus 1 to the degree of alpha. And this thing which vanishes is given by this. It's given by h df over f plus l df. 
Okay. So uh, this is the bump function. I didn't give it a name, h. And this is l. So I have f, h, and l. So this is a bump function which vanishes outside u. So that this term, the term of this wedge this, that is well defined everywhere. The only problem that it has is that it has a logarithmic singularity at d, because it's df over f. f is like x1. So this is like dx1 over x1. Okay, then this term uh, has L, which is smooth, and df, which is, uh, sorry, is it? Sorry, dh. Sorry, dh. So this is the derivative of the bump function. And this, uh, this thing uh, is, um, is also 0 outside u. So this is uh, also, this term is also smooth. So actually, this term doesn't even have a logarithmic singularity. So this one, these are both defined. This is both uh, defined. They're well defined. This one has a logarithmic singularity, and this one doesn't. Okay, and you can check. Very easy to check that the splitting of the derivative of alpha is the derivative of the splitting of alpha. And you can also see that if I compute the residue of this guy. This is smooth, so there is no residue term. This one is extracting uh, uh, the coefficient in front of this. Well, at d, this is equal to 1, so this doesn't contribute. And then I get alpha. So the residue of, um, of this s of alpha is, uh, is alpha. Now, I'm getting a sign problem. Please let me just go over. From the logarithm, exactly oh, oh, the yeah, exactly inside the smallest region, yeah, yeah. I'm getting a sign problem, so exercise, try to fix it. <laughs> but that's the basic idea. Um, so, so this means that H K log D is H K X. So the fact that we have this splitting tells us that the cohomology, you can compute it. It's the kth cohomology of x direct sum is isomorphic to the kth cohomology of x and the k minus 1 cohomology of d. And the way that you can, um, you can see the maps at least, you can see the map from here to here directly by taking the residue. And then you can see the map directly from here to here by just taking the inclusion. So as an example, x is s2, and d is s1 sitting inside s2, then the uh, cohomology of the, st the two-sphere is 1, 0, 1. And the cohomology uh, minus 1 of the one-sphere is 0, 1, 1. I just had to shift it because of this shift here. And if you just take the sum of this, we get 1, 1, 2, as the Betty numbers for the logarithmic groups. So what, do you not care about the links structure? Yes, we do. Why? <laughs> I don't want to talk about the ring structure, but yeah, definitely uh, you can, the ring structure is also a combination of, of these two ring structures. Yeah. That's important, for example, for these papers recently about finding differential form, you know, finding cohomology classes on logarithmic symplectic forms that are non-zero. If you know the ring structure, then you can take your class, raise it to the top power, and see that you have something non-zero. So what's the, you know, what, what is the definition? I don't want to, let's, let's not discuss. I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a theorem of Matseo and Melrose, which I linked to on the, on the exercise sheet. OK. Now, um, OK. Now, uh, this is not true in the complex case. Sequence 1 does not split. 
it gives a long exact sequence instead. So we have, instead we have hkx, hkx log d, um, hk minus 1 d, and then it goes on, hk plus 1 x, etc. It does not split, so there's no, you can't, uh, you can't use this to, to, to make a similar remark. However, it does not split in general. It does not split in general. Yeah. However, um, if we look at uh, fact two, um, fact two, what does it say? Um, so remember that we have this pullback from the logarithmic forms to the complement. Okay, and uh, and the interesting thing about this is that if we look locally, uh, so. Um, you can try to compute the local cohomology. So imagine that you evaluated these and took sections on small open sets. And this would be a complex, and this would be a complex of, sh of uh, sections on that little open set. And you could compute the Duram cohomology of that little open set. Okay? This would induce a map uh, on cohomology of that little open set. So this induces map on local cohomology um, you know, uh, let me put it like this, hk log on a small open set to uh, hk log open set of x minus t. Okay. And um, so on local cohomology, this is an isomorphism. So uh, let me just compute it locally. So near, near D, so D now the picture should look like this. This is D and this is X because D is now complex codimension one. Okay. So near D, if I want to compute the local cohomology of these logarithmic forms, you have to think, what, what am I going to have? Well, locally speaking, uh, we have like the Poincaré lemma, right? So that anything that's closed is exact locally, except for something important, which is that the constant is not exact, even though it's closed. So if I compute this cohomology logarithmic, and if I compute of x minus d on a small open set, so let's say u is like this, small open set, then I'm going to have uh, a one-dimensional space of just the constant function in degree 0. Okay. Now, in degree 1, Normally, I have the Poincaré lemma, so there's no, clo there's no uh, closed one forms which are not exact. But now I have a logarithmic one form, which is this dx over x. So there is a dx over x, which is closed, but which is not exact, which means that I have um, a non-zero local cohomology in degree one. And then above this, it's all zero in higher, in higher degrees. OK, on the other hand, what about the complement? Well, the complement locally what does it look like? Well, it's a punctured. It's punctured in a codimension one, so it basically is, is homotopic to a circle. So u uh, minus d is homotopic to a circle because it's it looks literally like this picture. If I puncture it, it looks like a little circle, and the cohomology of that, the Duram cohomology of that, is c in dimension zero in dimension zero and c in dimension one. So this is like you know d theta. And uh, this is C1. And this map is an isomorphism. So this means that this, 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 is, uh, this is an isomorphism on local cohomology. Yeah. So the, the statement then is that, so there's so such a morphism which induces, so morphism of complexes, which induces an isomorphism on local cohomology is called a quasi-isomorphism. And there's a theorem 
which says that a quasi-isomorphism induces an isomorphism on, on, uh, on hypercohomology groups. So that means that the logarithmic cohomology computes exactly the cohomology of the complement. So that's how different the smooth case is from the, from the holomorphic case. You get completely different uh, groups. OK. Um, OK. Uh, all right. So any questions about this, this uh, what I've said here? Uh, what is the link uh, in solomorphic case with quasim cohomology? Imagine that your structure is not a quasim structure. Yeah. Is that an isomorphic link in this case? Uh, Just to link it to uh, explain the quasim cohomology. I want to say yes, but let me just think about it a little okay. bit. Yeah. Um, I just want to say one thing, yeah. Um, it is, it's almost a good place to stop, stop. So I just want to indicate that a smooth divisor D in X is not the only type of co-dimension one object which for which Tx minus log D is a vector bundle, is a Lie algebra. Okay. Such divisors are called free divisors. And in the holomorphic category, there's a gigantic literature of free divisors. And the open problems in this field are truly uh, kind of incredible. I mean, some of them are kind of really interesting problems centering on computing, you know, for example, this logarithmic cohomology and such and such. Okay, so let me just explain an, uh, one class. A convenient class of free divisors uh, is the so-called normal crossing. So a normal crossing divisor looks like this, so D. D is a union of DI, where DI are smooth hypersurfaces, which intersect like um, the vanishing of a product of a monomial in the coordinates. So if you take a, a product of the monomial, if you take a monomial like that and look at its zero set, you'll get just a union of hyperplanes, a union of coordinate hyperplanes, which are just forming like a corner, okay? And that's what all of these intersections have to look like uh, between these hypersurfaces. That's called a normal crossing divisor. And in this case, um, Tx minus log d, this is generated by x1 d by dx1, x2 d by dx2, up to xk d by dxk, and then the other ones, d by dxk plus 1, d by dxn. Okay. And in this case, uh, you, know, you can imagine that, that if I have a logarithmic form, that means it has singularities here, 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 possibly singularities all, at all these lo loci. And so that means that I could take a residue and define a k, a k minus 1 form here. But that k minus 1 form will have singularities where the other things come and hit. So in this case, you can show that the same argument, same splitting argument, uh, can be extended uh, to show that 
the case logarithmic cohomology. Let me try to use. Is given like this. So this is in the smooth setting. In smooth setting, it's given by the kth cohomology of x plus the k minus 1 cohomology of the di's, sum over i, plus the k minus 2 cohomology of the di intersect dj, i less than j, and so on. Etc. You go down. All of, they all contribute. You could think of this as the residue. This is the residue of the residue, and the residue of the residue, et cetera. And you get all of these. And the last thing I'll say is that in the, whereas in the holomorphic category, can you guess it's just the cohomology of the complement? And this is a theorem of growth and deep. So the Matteo Melrose result it generalizes in this way. Okay, I'll leave it there and then uh, continue later. Oh yeah, there will be a normal lecture. Yeah.